My name is uh, Iftahi and Amit, and today we're going to talk about cybercrime. I had to put this um, just because someone forced me, so you can't read this. Uh, it's like in font two or something. This is the hacker me, all right? This is not the business me. I actually wear suits sometimes, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and this has nothing to do with what I'm actually working and doing, uh, so don't blame me or uh, attribute this to in any shape or form to my professional work. This is what we're going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to start by blabbering off about myself for like 60 seconds. Uh, we're going to talk about cyber war, attack and defense, cyber crime attack and defense, um, and then we're going to try to connect them. You should have done some homework before coming in here, or uh, if you haven't, I highly recommend you to, to do that after this talk, which is to see my DEF CON 17 talk, uh, because this is like a post text to what we found there. Uh, so what gives me the right to be here? I still haven't figured it out. Um, I have computer science education, and that's it. I'm not a CISSP uh, or uh, any other certification. Uh, I'm a hacker. I'm a researcher. I used to manage research for a few security companies focusing on uh, cyber crime, malware, uh, network forensics, and stuff like that. Uh, I used to manage development, so I've been on that side too of trying to build software rather, to, rather than break it. And in my whatever spare time that I have, I do some reserve duty for the Israeli Air Force uh, on, again, cyber stuff. I'm going to say a lot of cyber today um, because there's just not other terms to um, that work. I'm really going to try for this. What's that? Be it's me belt Turkish. No, Tommy, there's a gun in your trousers. What is a gun doing in your trousers? For protection. Protection from what? From the Germans? <laughs> yeah. If you do catch me, fucking around and, and just, just throwing FUD, uh, throw st something at me so I'll know I'm, I'm wrong, and please, please shout, because I can't hear everyone from here. If you got anything to say, if you want to go bullshit or something, just so stand up and, and say it. Uh, I'll be more than happy to amend this presentation and add info in, into it or, or remove info from it, as needed. So a quick recap. Uh, this talk is basically, uh, wouldn't be here, if it was for my research uh, from last year, last year I talked about, I was, I was doing some research on cybercrime, and I tried to figure out how it works from behind the scenes. Be beyond the technology, beyond the malware and the polymorphism, and the, um, I'm gonna wait with, with the, with the A-bomb, um, and all the technical stuff, just to see how it works from behind the scenes. Who is commissioned to write the software? Who's commissioned to run it? Uh, how does money get? A transfer between those entities, how an actual criminal organization is being managed. And this is where we kind of left off uh, from last year, where we found, I'm sorry about the projection, it's a little dark, but um, what you should see here um, are some documents that we found on a criminally operated server that we somehow managed to get access to. Uh, again, watch the talk from last year. Uh, that really didn't have a lot of commercial sense. Uh, if you're talking about cybercrime, you're always talking about how to make money. Well, you can't really sell this in the open market. Uh, these are uh, maps that are, were in a presentation, in a PowerPoint presentation, denoting uh, fighter target positions with their GPS coordinates uh, on a satellite view. Um, this is like a schedule for something. Um, you, you can probably read it out later on, on the slides. And a lot of stuff that shouldn't have been really out there. And I consider this out there because the way we got access to that criminal server is, is horrendously stupid. All right? It's just like having it on the internet, which, which is how it was. Um, this is finally declassified, so I don't have to skip through it like really quickly. Um, that's a, a software that, again, was accessible or was stolen. Uh, by this criminal organization. Uh, that software manages a air scenery, whatever, um, situation uh, for militaries that control, and, and it controls like the 
uh, bombing and whatever. It, it, it's got a lot of nifty stuff uh, that shouldn't be out there. Um, but again, finally uh, declassified, when I get some more information, uh, track back the, the DEF CON 17 talk, it's a lot of fun. And at that point where we, where we saw that kind of information on that server, we got hungry. Uh, well, at least I got hungry. And one of my uh, conclusions from last year's talk was, well, maybe we should try to kind of low jack some of the information or low jack the server itself because it kept moving. Which we actually did. We kind of fingerprinted the, uh, the different files and the different data that, that was on the server and trying to figure out where it's going to pop up. And it popped up. And this is why we're all, we're all here. Uh, and I can talk in DEF CON again about beyond cybercrime or where does cybercrime cyber connect to beyond just the uh, economic th uh, side of things. So, in order to do those connections, and the title is Cyber Crime War Connecting the Dots, first let's visit what's cyber crime or cyber war. What is this? Raise of hands. Bullet hole. Excellent. This is what we're dealing with on a daily basis. Why am I saying this? Because you don't know what that bullet hole relates to. Is it part of a gangbang shootout in the streets of whatever, Detroit? Or is it bullet hole in, in some armored vehicle that was shot in a battlefield? We're dealing with the little fragments, with the little incidents, technical incidents all the time, with the malware, with the exploit, with the vulnerability. And in this talk, I'm going to try and do that zoom out and kind of take a look at the whole scenery, all right? Try to figure out if this belongs to cybercrime or cyber war, and what is really the connection between these two. So I was kind of looking at the definitions and, uh, and what is cybercrime and cyber or war uh, versus crime. And the bottom line is that it's not that different. It might have a little different financing, but it's still heavily financed. Uh, management is a little different, but again, there's a lot of management, a lot of hierarchy, a lot of structure into how those things are, are being done. And when you go and look up what cyber war is, the Wikipedia definition, which I'm going to bash through this uh, through the next 50 minutes, says cyber warfare, all knows as blah, 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 is the use of computers and the internet in conducting warfare in cyberspace. Now, this definition is all nice and, and dandy, but, but again, it's missing a, a critical thing from my perspective, which, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, and if you're here in the US, you probably know this guy that was quoted saying, there is no cyber war. Who's this? Shmiri, right. Um, it might have been a poor you know, a slip of the tongue. It might have been politics or whatever it is. Uh, and there's always someone saying, well, there's no cyber war except uh, uh, when it happened in Estonia or, uh, you know what, maybe Georgia uh, or India, Google, Adobe. I mean, there's always an exception and there's always someone that tries to break out of that mold um, because there isn't really a, a solid definition of what cyber war is and how to treat it in the modern day and age. And what we're going to try and do here is really make the connections between the dots. Uh, really do connect the dots. Uh, we're going to look at some past events, cyber war events, and try to figure out where they came from, what was the MO, and how do, thing, how do these things connect in the global, uh, in the global perspective. Uh, cyber war is not only state versus state. All right? It's not only you know, Kremlin versus DC. Uh, it's neither just spy versus spy. All right? There's a whole area for uh, cyber espionage, which does happen all the time. And from my perspective, cyber espionage is the pretext of, of war. It's countries preparing for war. Therefore, they're conducting espionage on an active level uh, to make sure that they're going to be ready when the actual war, war is going to happen. And just like any war, civilian targets are going to be hit. All right? There's, there's going to be collateral damage at cyber war as well. We're not just talking about taking down a SCADA system here uh, or, or taking down uh, some military system over there. All right? We're talking about carpet bombing, DDoSing civilians, 
Um, and just like any war, propaganda and, and public image is also a big, big thing of it. There's been a lot of talk about cyber war, and I'm just going to quote or, or steal some stuff from McAfee with, with permission, of course. Uh, this is McAfee's uh, virtual criminology report from 2009, uh, where they kind of pointed out the countries developing advanced offensive cyber capabilities. Uh, they named it five different countries, uh, including the US, France, Russia, China, and Israel. Small country, the, the little dot in here. Can't even see it. Uh, but size doesn't matter. Trust me. <laughs> in this talk, um, I, I do believe McAfee, and I do believe that France has a lot of uh, offensive capabilities until the, the Germans come over. Um, in this talk, <laughs> um, <laughs> in this talk, though, I'm going to talk about uh, all those countries minus France plus Iran because they, they have been a little more active, as you probably know in this whole cyber thingy uh, that everyone wants, likes, likes to talk about. Uh, and again, size doesn't matter. Uh, we're the smallest, but the biggest. Um, so without further ado, let's cover like, those five countries really quickly and then move over to the criminal side. So this is it, the US. Um, not a lot of secrets to kind of unveil because everything is fairly well documented. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on around cyber war. If you've been at the, at the Meet the Feds talk yesterday, you've heard the number of open jobs that DOD and the Air Force and, and STRACOM have for, uh, for cyber warriors or, or experts or whatever you want to call them. Uh, they're recruiting massively, okay? Setting up uh, STRATCOM, for example, with General uh, Keith Alexander, if I'm not mistaken, uh, heading this joint effort from all the military sides as well as the NSA and stuff like that. Uh, the usual suspects, uh, NSA, uh, the best TLA ever that I saw here was CAT. Anyone knows what CAT is? No? Oh, come on. You should see the logo. It, it's kind of not presented well here. CAT is a cyber action team. It's a unit in the FBI, all right, responsible for cyber action. Uh, I wonder how, how much action did these guys get. Russia, all right. Russia is, is again fairly well documented. The only problem with Russia is terminology. There's been a lot of movements there, especially post the like the Soviet Union, whatever. Uh, so a lot of a lot of agencies got new names and split up and merged back. Uh, I'm just going to name the few that are actually active on that uh, on that front. The GRU is the main directorate of. Uh, um, the Russian Armed Forces. Uh, they do a lot of uh, cyber espionage and, and foreign stuff. SVR uh, and FSB are uh, internal and external, uh, kind of the equivalent of NSA and FBI, to give or take. FSB used to be called the KGB, so uh, these, are, these are the same guys. Again, terminology. I love their logos, by the way. Really, really cool. I mean, if you could get those for, for laptop stickers, <laughs> Please do. Uh, shoot me an email. <laughs> um, one of my favorite ag agencies is just called the Center for Research of Military Strength of Foreign Countries. All right? So there's no hiding about it. It's, it's like me walking yesterday in Vegas with an I'm a liability t shirt. It's like, you know, no surprises. <laughs> um, and the last but not least, uh, there's a thing in Russia called NASHI, uh, it's the National Youth, Youth Associations. Uh, there are several of these. They're, they're kind of political party for teenagers or uh, I don't know. Um, it's kind of a Boy Scouts but with a political flavor on, uh, into it. Um, tightly coupled with the actual political parties, if you can say that, uh, in Russia. And these guys carry out a lot of uh, actions that the party wants them uh, without being directly connected to like government decisions. So remember these, we're going to talk about them in, in like 20 minutes. China. There have been enough talks about China. Um, again, read the Northrop Grumman report. It's got a lot of information that was kind of available before, but they just kind of concentrated it and, and summarized it very, very well. Uh, some people call it old. I'm, I'm, I just tell them, you know, read it through. Uh, because it's got a lot, of, uh, a lot of scattered information that was available before, so it might be a little old, uh, but in a very well-formed for manner. 
Um, these guys run the uh, third and fourth general staff departments um, for electronic countermeasures and, elect and SIGINT, and signal intelligence, um, which basically mean offense and defense, respectively. Um, and yes, these guys have been practicing, all right? Tidal Rain, um, Google, whatever. Uh, they have the capabilities, they have the knowledge, and they definitely have the infrastructure and the hierarchy to run all those uh, attack and defense. Iran. That's a little kind of shady. Not a lot of information. Uh, the one thing that you may notice in Iran is the amount of growth they went through in the past five years in terms of internet connectivity. And this is fiber connectivity. Okay. Um, by the way, the telecommunication infrastructure company, is, it's like the monopoly for internet communication in Iran, is the government telecom monopoly and works very, very closely with the Iranian armed forces. Okay, so everything is controlled by them. If you thought that the Chinese uh, uh, Great Firewall is, is strict, check out Iran, all right? It's even worse. Last but not least, uh, Israel. Um, you're not gonna see anything interesting here because this is all Google stuff. Uh, I can't really tell you like from the trenches stuff. Uh, so it's gonna be a little boring. Google it, there's a lot of information, and, and again, it's going to give you some perspective on what's going on. Uh, IDF, uh, IDF uh, is like the main uh, actor in terms of uh, cyber offense and defense, uh, adding a lot of uh, attack capabilities. Okay, again, Google, you'll find this. Uh, in the IDF, they have C4Is, which you, know, uh, you guys have here as well command, control, communication, computers, and intelligence branches in all the uh, different branches of, of the military. Uh, so you have intelligence, air force, and uh, navy. Staffing is mostly homegrown, and people get actually trained in the army to do cyber stuff, which is a little different, again, than, uh, than here, where you can recruit people to join uh, the government or, or the military to do some uh, cyber stuff after they've gained their uh, profession out in the industry. And uh, again, last but not least, Mossad. Um, again, it's, it's a fancy word for, for NSA or, or some spy agency, uh, but it's not that secretive anymore. We have a web, they have a website, sorry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they have a website with uh, like job section on it, so you can actually check out the jobs and based on you know, the open jobs uh, uh, they post there, you can kind of figure out what they're doing in terms of uh, capability building and, and uh, infrastructure. So let's get back to a uh, cyber war and let's bash, you know, once and for all the Wikipedia definition. In my book, all right, a cyber war, or at least an attack in cyber war, is a highly selective targeting of military and critical resources. Again, we're veering away from just military and, and bouncing in critical uh, resources as well, in conjunction with a kinetic attack. All right, this is war. This is, you know, strategy broken down into tactics. So you move, you know, tanks and, and platoons on the ground here, and to support them or to complement their movement and attack or in defense and whatever it is, you run a cyber attack, all right, on the military that they're facing, on the area that they're going into, you want to blank it out, whatever it is. Or just DDoS a region, okay? Uh, have everyone put their finger on the uh, death grip of the, of the iPhone involuntarily or whatever it is to blank out a region to get the public's attention or to deny the public accessibility to up-to-date information. Very effective, works all the time. It's the equivalent of the Vietnam, you know, throwing leaflets uh, from, from B-52s on, on, on like the civilian population. So this is cyber war, again, in my book. You can argue all you want, all right? That's what I think. You wanna take it out to the bar, that's fine. Um, so there is cyber war and, and there was acts of cyber war as, as we'll see in, in a few minutes. On the defense side, uh, yeah. We're not really there. Um, because targets are never just military, we're talking about civilian as well. And civilian is, is 
you know, beyond critical infrastructure. It can be media, it can be hospital, it can be hospitality, it can be a lot of other things that can affect the public opinion uh, and the public view of things. Uh, physical and logical protections as a defensive side should be considered as a last act of uh, defense, all right? And the ability to shut down a service voluntarily in order while preventing access from civilian uh, population is in the book of, you know, acts and tactics to retain that survivability of the, the service or whatever it is. Uh, so this should be considered a valid tactic uh, in terms of defense, actually shutting down things or preventing access uh, to, you know, fight against the DDoS or whatever it is. Okay, so we've covered cyber war, attack, defense, fairly easy. Let's talk about cyber crime before we connect it to. If this doesn't show up when you're talking about cyber crime, you're doing it wrong. All right, it's, it's, you're missing something. Look for this, very easy, all right? And you might be surprised sometimes. Uh, I was, I've gotta tell you, uh, surprised a lot of times when this popped up in, in weird places. Uh, so this is, in my book, Definitions of Cybercrime. These guys work. These guys are like the Gordon Geckos of the, the crime world. They have a very well organized uh, uh, methodolo uh, well, methodical uh, infrastructure and hierarchy. And they work just like any Fortune 500 company. There's a CEO, there are VPs, there are marketing channels, there are guys on the ground, there's an IT department. They outsource a hell of a lot of stuff uh, because it's cheap and it's easy. And, and again, check out the talk from last year to get some more information on how this actually works uh, in terms of cybercrime. In terms of attacks, this is the stuff that we're all kind of seeing all the time, uh, every day. Usual channels, web, mail, open services, uh, where we get all the spam and the malware and the uh, and PDFs uh, and stuff like that that steals our social security numbers and runs transactions for us. Targeted attacks are going to happen on premium resources, all right? Um, I'm not going to say it, but I'm going to say it. Google and stuff like that is a prime target, all right? Uh, specific companies with specific assets are prime targets. <coughs> F-35. Um, carpet bombing is going to be used for most attacks. You know, the, 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 the standard ops are going to be, you know, with, with the farming and fishing and stuff like that. Um, but they're going to be very, very geographically targeted, all right? Because you can't send a Bank of America spam to guys in France. And you can't uh, send a Deutsche Bank spam to, to customers in, uh, in the UK. So everything is very, very geographically uh, targeted and, uh, and segmented in terms of marketing. Hence, again, the structure above it, all right? You're going to have bodies or organizations specializing in specific regions. Uh, secondary infections will happen through the, the initial ones. So once you get a, a foothold in, in one, on one asset or, or on one organization uh, or market segment, it's usually going to uh, be based to pivot off additional attacks. This is how it looks like. Uh, and again, this is from last year, so for not updating this. Um, these are the effects of a single criminal server in terms of the sites that it infected uh, or compromised to carry on their attacks, okay? So we mapped out, we, we you know, lit up a point, uh, this is obviously an approximation, it's not like, you know, uh, for every domain and URL that was compromised to include malicious attack code, and we put it geographically. Now you have to remember that that server from last year did cater for at least five different criminal organizations, all right? This, this is like SaaS for criminals. Uh, so everyone was running their own regional thing. Uh, and again, you can kind of see that with the focus on east and west coast of the US, uh, the western part of, of Europe, and, and some scattered attacks, uh, East Asia, Australia, and uh, some of Brazil and uh, South America. This is how it looks like in terms of, of the actual groups, all right? Once you start tracking back uh, whose account is it on the server that runs the, uh, the attack on those URLs and whose account is, is another one, 
uh, and you map it out with intelligence information from law enforcement and your own kind of open source intelligence, you can kind of focus down on the groups that actually run the criminal operations. So again, it's not a big surprise, these groups specialize in their specific geographical regions. In terms of ammunition, this is one of my favorites, uh, Zeus, if you don't know it. If you want a copy, just, just ping me. Uh, uh, very easy, all right? And this still baffles like 99% of, of AVs. If you click here, build loader, you're gonna get a new copy of the actual Trojan, the executable, with a very, very low detection rate. And if it's not low enough for you, just click again. And again, and again, and again. You can test it on virus total or test it yourself. It's, it's got a GUI, I mean, seriously. Uh, it's got a config file, you tell it what you wanna do, uh, which websites you wanna uh, attack, which websites you wanna alter on the user's browser. Um, this is, all right, and again, I'm gonna get a lot of crap for it, uh, an APT. It's an advanced persistent threat. It stays on PC, it goes fairly well undetected, um, and it's very advanced. You can do a lot of neat stuff with, with Zeus. Uh, it's got a web portion to it as well, that's the command control center, so every bot, every instance of that loader that you've built, uh, that gets ins installed on a, on a victim's machine, pops up here, you can filter this by, again, uh, geographical regions, you can group them together to form different uh, uh, administrative groups. Uh, this caters for multiple users, so you can have, and again, you can have different permissions for different users managing this system. This, this is, you know, this is the, the shit. Um, you can drill down, obviously, issue commands, look at the data that, uh, that was harvested from those uh, PCs, uh, you can filter them by connection speed so that you can group the fastest connections into a group called DDoS and the slowest ones for a group called check later uh, and so on and so forth. It's very easy to use. Again, you don't need to be like an Uber hacker um, from DEF CON to do this. You can be, you know, my mom. <laughs> this is fire and forget. Defense, again. I hate those signs, but you know, what can you do? We have antivirus, malware, spyware, rootkit, Trojan, tons of companies that make a lot of money, but seriously, when was the last time you've seen one of those actually work against a really, really good threat? All right, this is, uh, again, I've, I've just ran the click loader thing, the, the build loader thing, uh, and you can very easily go to this, to get to this stage where the results are zero out of 42 antiviruses that detected this as malicious, not even suspicious, all right? We are lacking on the defense side. Uh, and then you have guys saying, well, but we have firewalls and IDSs and IB IPSs and stuff that, that runs on the network with agents and Tron and stuff like that. But seriously, all of that, those attack vectors go through port 80 and 443, and 5.3. And what happens over SSL? Your IPS and IDS is blind to most of the encrypted stuff that goes on your network. You, you don't even know what's going on there. You want your IDS to do something about it? Yeah. So we have a problem. How do these two connect? I've talked about cybercrime, I've talked about cyber war, and my claim is that cybercrime is being used to conduct cyber war, all right? These are the, the dirty workers of the governments that carry out their you know, nasty attacks. And I can claim this all day, but without proof, we're gonna go nowhere. So uh, again, I'm only gonna talk about stuff that I can attest to, that I've seen, that I have data for. You're gonna probably wanna say, hey Ian, you missed this and that. And, Fine, I might have, but I haven't seen like actual data from it, so I'm not gonna include it here. Uh, one of the things, you know, the first thing that comes to mind when you, when you talk about cyber war is Estonia. Uh, it's been bashed to death, and I don't feel like talking about it because it's, it's fairly boring, and it didn't have a real kinetic act in it. Uh, so yes, a lot of people made their careers over you know, analyzing this to death. Uh, read about it, it's interesting. Next, Israel, let's cover some, some interesting events. 
Uh, cyber war in Israel. We have two events that uh, can be constituted as cyber war uh, events in Israel. Um, they happened th during cast led and the second Lebanon war. All right. Again, Google it. It's not that difficult if you're you know, kind of weak on, on Middle East history. <laughs> Yeah, I don't blame you. Uh, one of the interesting incidents is that the Palestinian TV was hacked as propaganda. All right? So you just hack the TV and broadcast whatever shit you want. Love Israel and stuff like that. You know, run for your houses. The, your leaders don't like you. Whatever you, you want to say there, easy. Everyone's got a TV these days, even the guys in Gaza. Another event which is much more interesting is this. Can anyone, anyone knows what this is? What? Syria. 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 All right. This was my birthday present, uh, September uh, 6. All right. Remember, you want to send me some stuff. 2007. Um, this came out. This is a Syrian nuclear facility. All right. And this is how it looked like on December 6, 2007. Uh, Operation called Operation Orchard. Uh, again, look it up. The, the link to the Wikipedia article is here. This stuff blew up. Um, allegedly, by Israeli Air Force bombers. Now, if you know your geography a little bit, you know that to get from Israel to Syria, you've you, you got to pass another country or two. I'm saying allegedly because none of those countries in, in the middle, namely Lebanon and Turkey, have any recollection or any evidence on their radars that there was any Israeli aircraft passing by. All right, so this just blew up out of thin air. Um, there's a, again, Google it, there's a lot of funny stories about it. The Syrian reaction initially was it didn't happen. And uh, <laughs> there's an actual picture missing here. I, 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 I need to find it and update this, where they actually bulldozed that area and just wiped out any evidence that there was any building there. Uh, kind of like saying, what, what, what building? It didn't blow up. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it, it was kind of uh, awkward because again, you need to get planes from here to here, but there's no evidence that this happened. So um, again, obviously there was on top of the kinetic, and you can obviously, there's a kinetic effect here. <laughs> on top of the kinetic effort, there was some kind of electronic cyber something effort that affected two different countries. Okay, so yeah, stuff happens. Um, let's talk about uh, a more cast-led and, and second Lebanon war. If you look at all the events that happened throughout that that period, uh, all the attacks on both Israeli and, and Arabic targets uh, are attributed to hacktivists. Okay, uh, surprisingly enough, those attacks mostly happened in conjunction with kinetic attacks. All right, in, in like a fairly well synchronized manner. Uh, one of my favorites is this. This was actually uh, this was a website that promoted uh, pro Israelis to download software that will be used to DDoS different targets. Um, so yeah, it's <laughs> who needs Zeus when you can just tell people to download this stuff. <laughs> um, Let's talk about another organization in this, this whole uh, scheme of things. AR Hack. Uh, it's a hacker forum by day, cybercrime operations by night. All right? uh, it's a very popular Arabic uh, speaking forum okay, that have this. Uh, wow, you can't really see this. There's, there's like political posts, uh, anti Israel, pro Gaza, pro whatever it is. I'm not going to get into politics. Uh, that goes around on, on the hacktivist side that looks very kind of, you know, uh, uh, from the trenches. On the other hand, they're buying and selling cards for ha half their balance, all right? And uh, selling 1,600 Visa cards, uh, um, you know, in bulk. So it's, it's kind of a dual hat thing going on. On one hand, it's, it's a proper crime, crime organization, very organized, all the stuff that we've talked about in the past year. Years. On the other hand, it's kind of hacktivism, you know, let's talk about politics and stuff like that. And so, again, connecting the dots is not that difficult over there. Georgia, off from Israel to you know, a little northwest. Uh, this was, from my perspective, the most interesting incident or case that you can 
uh, analyze from a cyber war, cyber crime uh, perspective. It is the most interesting because it had the, the most synchronized kinetic and cyber attacks uh, in, a, in a campaign. The targets were mostly civilian. Mostly civilian, all right? Mostly uh, media outlets and, and like general public websites, the, the president's website and stuff like that. And all the attacks were launched from civilian networks. It's not like, you know, Kremlin.ru was the, the, the source for all those uh, uh, command control uh, communications or the actual attacks. Now, in order to talk about Georgia and, and the Georgia-Russia conflict, you have to talk about Russia first. Wow, I'm losing like half my slides here. Um, there's a big dilemma in Russia. Uh, the dilemma revolves around the connection between criminal organizations and state or government. If any of those names make sense to you, you know what I'm talking about. All right, these are all companies, like legitimate companies, that are Russia-based or Russia-connected that have a very, very uh, strong affinity to criminal outlets and to criminal activities. Uh, obviously, RBN, Trivio, uh, EST Domains, uh, Mikolo. Everyone remember Mikolo from last year? All right. Um, these, are, these all have connections back into the Russian government and the Russian politicians that basically allow these things to, to keep running. Uh, let's map out just a few of those connections. Uh, again, this, this is like a, an offhand, quick connection. I'm sure there's more, uh, but just to understand things. HostFresh and the UKR Telegroup are hosted by Atrivio, which is a customer of EST Domains, which is a customer of RBN, the Russian Business Network. If you remember the Russian Business Network, it went down in 2008. When it went down, it was moved to China, HostFresh. <laughs> Then it came back up to Russia and kept running because, again, there's no one to stop it there. It's not like people got sued or uh, fined. Uh, RBN's network providers are also UKR Telegroup and HostFresh. All right? Very highly connected. When you talk about EST domains and Mikolo, you know these guys are actually bad guys. All right? Uh, there's no doubt about it. There's enough proof to say they have criminal uh, affinity. If you talk about RBN, you know they're highly connected to the Russian government. If you talk about Mikolo, you know that uh, the guy that committed suicide was you know, like a cousin of some Politburo in Russia that allowed this whole thing to, to actually run. So you get my point. So the, back to the actual attack in Georgia. This is what started the, uh, the cyber aspect of it. All right? uh, you start seeing commands. Uh, issued from the uh, standard CNC servers, uh, basically saying flood, you know, president.gov.ge over HTTP, UDP, and TCP, uh, HTTP, TCP, and ICMP. Um, <clears throat> the CNCs were, were shut down and then uh, brought up again, and the second attack started as troops started crossing the border towards uh, Georgia. All right? Again, very, very uh, highly synchronized kinetic and cyber attacks. Now, the interesting thing about those command and control servers is that they were, uh, again, they were used to attack all those media outlets and the president's website uh, and Kasparov's website because there, there's a thing in Russia because Kasparov, Kasparov was Georgian and they don't like him. So they're, they're like, yeah, add Kasparov to the thing. <laughs> um, at the same time, the same command control servers were still operating business as usual, and business in cybercrime is making money. So they're still, you know, attacking porn sites to get to extort them, uh, adult escort services, Nazi, Nazi and racist sites, Carter forums, gambling sites, you know, the, the usual dealing and scheming of, uh, of cybercrime. Connecting the dots, not that difficult, I think, all right? Uh, and the, fact is, uh, the facts are all out there. Iran, I've got 10 minutes, so I'm going to blow through this. Um, you know Twitter? Anyone doesn't know Twitter? Good, all right. <laughs> Great crowd. Um, 2009, Twitter went down, uh, DNS hacked. The political connections uh, of that specific attack are just too obvious to ignore. Uh, it was the elections in, uh, uh, in Iran. 
uh, right, right around the UN Council decisions to ban Iran and, and do bad stuff to them, and protest kind of uh, protests against the leadership in, in Tehran. This is what the attack looked like. All right, again, I hit those slides. Um, this is what Twitter looked like uh, when you try to access it during the attack. Um, if you try to Google it, you'll you'll get that you know this Arabic speaking or Farsi speaking page. Um, basically saying this is the Iranian cyber army. Um, we protest this and we don't like you and Twitter's down so get your 40, 140 characters somewhere else. Um, this was taken down, the, this thing happened on December 18, 2009. All right? uh, and again, the attack was attributed to the Iranian cyber army. Until December 2009, by the way, if you were following those kind of intelligence forums and stuff like that, there was no Iranian cyber army. All right, this is like a new thing that happened just for Twitter. But if you, again, closely look at the affiliations between the groups, you realize that the Iranian cyber army is actually part of a group called ASEAN. It's a Shiite group of, again, hackers and, and activists and stuff like that running inside Iran. And ASEAN's, you know, kind of defacement logo and, and technologies and, and techniques are very, 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 very similar to what we've seen in the Iranian cyber army back uh, on Twitter. All right, again, this is from uh, attrition. You, you can see the actual defacements. And they use the, the actual same HTML template to push onto the defaced sites. Um, <clears throat> And again, just check out the forum, get someone who speaks Farsi or Arabic, and, and you, you can see how it operates. Uh, to make things a little uh, easier, this is a peek from the Iranian cyber army subgroup inside the ASEAN forums. Uh, they have a section called War Games. I shit you not. Uh, and in those war games, uh, you can see the post from like one of the trainers or, or whatever you want to call them, leaders. Uh, saying, all right, the war game target for this week, month, whatever it is, is this website. They have rules of engagement, scoring. It's kind of like capture the flag, but for real. Um, <laughs> yeah. And the targets of that capture the flag is not some, you know, here's a VM image, you need to protect it or attack it. Chester County Natural Gas Authority. All right, out of uh, South Carolina somewhere. This is a target practice, okay? You can't make this shit up. It's in the forums, go see. And the target changes every time there's a new war game. So these guys are actually practicing on critical infrastructure, or, or Chester County, I mean, just infrastructure <laughs> uh, targets as a practice for the actual you know, D-Day, when, when things are gonna you know, really happen. Now, let's take a look, another, another quick look at the 18th. What other big thing happened on December 18th? Can anyone point out like a big event? No? Oh, seriously. The same day that Twitter went down, everyone was so fucking busy complaining that they can't tweet from the restroom or whatever it is, <laughs> that the Iranians seized an Iraqi oil well across the border, okay? No one remembers this? Come on, it's ground troops moving the border, crossing the border. It's ours now. And no one notices this. Why? Because Twitter's down and everyone's busy <laughs> trying to get Twitter back up. Coincidence? I don't know. Maybe. I don't think so. Baidu, again, another incident between Iran and China this time. Uh, a little more recent than this 2009 thing. Uh, again, same thing. Look at what happened around the time when Baidu was taken down. So let's sum things up a little bit on the Iranian kind of cyber crime connections. ASEAN group, their usual kind of MO is DDoS, side defacements, credit cards, botnet hurting, you know, the, the, the usual stuff. Iranian cyber army is a subgroup running inside ASEAN doing strategic attacks and war games and training uh, on critical uh, targets or, or interesting targets in the US and China, okay? The line differentiating between cybercrime and cyber war, uh, not that clear anymore. 
right? Connecting the dots, very easy. Let's talk really quickly about China because we're running out of time. Um, China was very interesting in terms of the, the, the recent happenings, APT, Google stuff. Um, Google was down not as, you know, Twitter, we lost a few hours of DNS. It was down on its knees begging for, yeah. Um, Adobe, same thing. And the, uh, I'm just quoting this because the wording the, from, from the statement, the PR statements for both Adobe and Google were kind of similar. Uh, I was fortunate enough to, to help analyze or whatever it is uh, other companies that were hit by the same attack. So, um, you know, the MO was as ODA and IE uh, to get into Go Adobe, Google, and other, you know, 40 different companies. And the initial reaction was that, you know, the Chinese are here. It's like the Germans. <laughs> um, the only problem was that all of the attacks had the same, you know, kind of mark of a cyber crime attack, oh, just like the ones we've seen before. All right, APT was used because everyone was fucking baffled. It's like, what? We're just gonna say it's, it's malware again? No, this is APT. <laughs> it's very sophisticated. Um, the U.S. response to it, again, very funny. Uh, beg my, my non-political correctness. Uh, we look to the Chinese government <laughs> uh, for an explanation. Uh, the ability to operate with confidence in cyberspace is critical in modern society, blah, 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 blah. Uh, Hillary Clinton. So we look to the Chinese government. Why are you looking at the Chinese government when it could be anyone that launched the attack from China? And the mark is very clear that this is like a very criminal, you know, MO. The Chinese reaction was classic. Wasn't me. You look, it wasn't me. You can't argue with that. You just can't. <laughs> Try arguing with a four year old. It wasn't me. <laughs> but it wasn't me. <laughs> all right, we get it. It wasn't you. <laughs> classic, classic, all right. Um, yeah, the, the, the connection between state and crime, I mean, the, the incentive and, and the mutual benefits are, are very, very obvious. If you let people run off your infrastructure or, you know, stuff in your country, internet doesn't have borders. So attribution, first time I said it in a cyber crime talk, wow, a cyber warfare talk, <laughs> uh, attribution is, 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 is a problem uh, and you're not going to get it. It's a win-win situation for every country and for every state that wants to, you know, launder their dirty business through a criminal outlet in another state to attack a third state, it's, it's child's play, okay? Everything is accessible, everything is, is very easy. Let's take a one minute look at the future, all right? An illustrated uh, look at the future. Um, so our oracle, you know, says what this is. What is this? All PC, all right. Um, you know what, how these things work. Right now, what if you give a lot of these, all right, and one of them gets infected, and you give them into a country that doesn't really have the the, the capital to start purchasing services and antiviruses and protection and stuff like that? You get one of the biggest botnets on earth. All right, so take a look at this. Wonder why OLPC didn't make it the first round? Well, yeah, security. They didn't think it out. They didn't think it through. Uh, and sending it to like third world countries that are not going to put, you know, McAfee or Kaspersky on it. Or Semantic, or sorry if I missed anyone. Some more future. Uh, there's no weapons of mass destruction, all right? Uh, uh, contrary to common belief, there's no, well, now there is a, the, the internet kill switch. <laughs> uh, but yeah, seriously, weapons of mass destruction in the future is still connectivity. Okay? The more connectivity you have, the more power you have. Especially if it's dispersed around the world. All right? Back to attrib attribution. And what's better than connectivity? Cloud. Cloud is the dream of criminals and countries alike. Uh, because again, it, it, it even further distances attribution and gives you more power, you know, on demand. Okay? So look for more. Malware, 
malicious stuff on the cloud, again, I'm not going to do that, you know, look at Amazon EC2 and malicious servers talk because someone else did it. So let's uh, sum things up and I'll be right on time, hopefully. The good and the bad, as usually, all right, the good thing is that this is getting some proper attention. And again, I, I was very happy to listen to the Meet the Fed talk yesterday. You see a lot of governments training and adding capabilities to handle these kind of scenarios, all right? And, and starting to realize that their policies from four or five year, years ago aren't wor worth the paper they're printed on. And they print a lot of paper for some reason. The bad side is, is that commercial development of malware is still king, all right? If you want to have a really cool malware, you get it outsourced, all right? You buy it off someone, um, and believe me, in that criminal world, it's, it's happening all the time. As usual, when you mix good and bad, you get the ugly, uh, good meets bad. Money changes hands, less tracks to cover, criminal ops already uh, uh, creating the weapons for the countries that don't have the skills. So while you're training your people, who's gonna carry out the actual attacks? The guys that already have it. Fix the future, all right? Uh, uh, you're not gonna fix cyber war before fixing cyber crime. So whatever we're doing in making law enforcement talk across borders, again, internet is borderless, apply that later on for state versus state. Um, that's it for this. Before I get kicked off, if you have any questions, we'll be in room 112. 112, right? 112. Thank you very much. Have a good day.